Hello and welcome to Stowe Talks, a podcast designed to support people going through relationship breakdown and all the challenges this brings. I'm Matthew Taylor. And I'm Lisa Gatchell, family lawyers at Stowe Family Law, and today we're looking at how to prepare for your financial settlement as part of a divorce. So I guess the first question then, Matt, is what is a financial settlement? When we talk about financial settlements, there's a number of things that the court can do. And I don't want to get too much into the legals on this, but there are some phrases that you might see, you might hear when you're starting a divorce process that need a little bit of unpacking. So you can have property adjustment orders. That's an order that provides for an adjustment in the way a property is held. So if the family home is being transferred into one party's sole name. Pension sharing orders, and we talked about those quite a bit on the pod, but that's a way of ensuring that someone can have a share of someone else's pension. Then there's payments of lump sums, there's spousal maintenance payments, which are ongoing maintenance payments. So really, when you're looking at a financial settlement, you're asking the question, how do we divide up everything financially involved in the marriage? So I think, is that a sort of fair description, Lisa? Is there anything else that you'd sort of add to that? What, you know, how do you explain it to clients in, in first meetings and things? Pretty much the same as you just have, really. So yeah, it's about trying to... You know, marriage is ultimately a contract, isn't it? So we're trying to sort out the finances on the breakdown of that contract. So, you know, what are we going to do with the house? What are we going to do with savings, investments? Are they going to be transferred? Are they going to be sold? Um, So, yeah, pretty much exactly the same as you've just said there. And I mean, there's lots of ways for us to do that then, isn't there, Matt? So, you know, we've talked Mm, we've talked a lot about mediation. So you can go along to mediation to see if you can reach a, a financial agreement. You could have negotiations between solicitors. You can do it around the kitchen table to a certain extent. If you want to have some of those discussions, I would just um, suggest that you do get some advice alongside that if that is an option that you're going to take. And if you can't reach an agreement, then we can look at things like court proceedings and arbitration. I suppose what we need to start with is when we're looking at financial settlements, there's, there's something that has to be done before any of these types of negotiations can take place. And that's that we need to have full and frank financial disclosure. Um, And that's a term that we use as lawyers. So that basically means that you have to provide details of all assets and income, whether it's in your name um, or joint names with somebody else. So anything that your name is on, basically. Um, And we do that ordinarily or we suggest that we do that ordinarily via exchange of form E's. Do you want to explain what a form E is, Matt? Yeah, and this is going to strike absolute terror in the heart of anyone who has <laughs> just gone through it or is about to go through it um, because everyone hates them. Um, so for me, and when I say everyone, I mean normal people, lawyers like me love them. They're useful, really handy things. So for me, and if you're not familiar with it, Google it. They're available for you in the sort of government judiciary website. Um, it's a really detailed, long and, to be frank, tedious form where you set out all that you've got in terms of your finances and you go through it and you provide details of your house and the mortgage and the land, re- you know, the registration number, the land registry. You give you all your bank statements, your bank account details, and you provide documents with these. So you've got to give 12 months bank statements for every bank account. If you've got investments, if you've got pensions, if you've got certain types of life insurance policies, so there's all that about the sort of capital. It breaks down into sort of three stages, really, which kind of mirrors the general process. So I suppose four stages. There's a bit of an intro section where you talk about, you know, who is the family? What's the date of marriage? What's the date of separation? The second section is about your capital. What have you got in bank accounts? What have you got in um, properties? What have you got in pensions? What have you got in companies? The next section goes on to income. What do you receive in income? What have you historically received in income? If there's any fluctuations in income, we got benefits, all, all of that. And then the fourth section is the, and that's all quite mechanical, those first three sections. It is, you know, there is areas of discretion. Some people are better at filling them in than others. I take the view that give as much detail as you can and possibly over disclose because it makes the whole process quicker. Because if you don't, and we'll come on to this in a minute, if you don't give disclosure, you're only going to get chased for it. And then you come to the last section, which is a narrative section. And that's, I mean, I think probably the trickiest section to fill in in knowing how to balance it and what to put. So there's a variety of sections, including details about what your future living expenses are going to be. So you provide a budget for what you think you need going forwards. Um, You put a bit about the standard of living during the marriage. And then there is a box, which is my least favourite part of the form, uh, which asks about conduct. 
Um, so I wonder if we should just talk about that a little bit, because I don't know about you, Lisa, is when you know, my clients are, I say, go and fill out a draft of this for me, give it a go, try and do it yourself, then come back to us and we'll have a, we'll have a look at it. And this conduct box is often filled in. Do you get that a lot? Yeah, I think the contact box is always filled in yeah. um, with something. And almost because it's a form and there's a box that asks about it, people feel like they have to put something within the box. Yeah, yeah, totally. And that's quite often very understandable things about ways in which, you know, my client might feel aggrieved about something that's happened during the marriage, about the way the marriage has broken down. But maybe someone's had an affair, all stuff that when you see the word conduct, you know, what is it and it's sort of described as bad behavior is, is stuff that's in there. Now, I think that box needs to come out of the form because when we're talking about conduct and behavior in financial remedy proceedings, the threshold for it affecting a financial settlement is really quite high. Historically, it's almost exclusively, there's a couple of cases, reported cases that don't include financial ramifications, but generally the conduct has to be financially relevant. It has to cause a loss of assets or a reduction in future income or, or, or something like that, because these are financial proceedings. These are not moralistic judgments about the way someone's behaved. And the court really hates on picking bad behavior during the marriage, because where do you end? And it's incredibly subjective and often won't have a view. There is a bit of a move at the moment, I think. Um, and when I say at the moment, we're recording this October 2023. At the start of 23, there was a, a case which dealt with economic abuse in financial remedy proceedings, which was quite, which is potentially quite influential. And I think there's a greater awareness. And obviously, we talked about abuse a lot on this uh, on the podcast and economic abuse about those being factored in. But even still, um, in general, conduct so rarely figures in financial remedy arguments that my view would be rarely 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 fill it in like fingers of one hand the amount of times i've had it filled in on one of my cases um it generally won't go anywhere and it'll raise the temperature really badly i take it out of form personally um but but there you go i mean what's your lisa what's your kind of how do your clients react when you say here's a for me have a look uh terror <laughs> i think um it's kind of a i don't even know where to start with it yeah as lawyers, when we send these forms out to people, we're not expecting them to be able to complete the entire form by themselves without any assistance or necessarily complete the form at all. What we need is the supporting documents. Mm. So what we need is all of the bank statements. We need the valuation of the property. We need the mortgage figures, um, because if you provide us with all of that information, then we can we can do the form for you relatively easily. Obviously, the more of the form that you do yourself, the more cost saving that's going to be rather than having us do it for you. Um, and equally, the way you provide that information can also impact on your costs. So if you provide us with 50 emails, each one having separate jumbled up bank statements attached to it, it's going to take us a huge amount of time to go through all of that documentation and get it into a, a nice orderly fashion to go with the for me and to be able to get the information out of it in a way in the, in the way that we need it to be. If, however, you provide us with the, the documentation um, all complete and all in chronological order, then that makes our jobs significantly easier. And I think that's really it's that background work that that the clients really need to be to be doing and engaging with. So speak to your mortgage company. So when we're looking at the property, for example, um, get three estate, estate agents out to value the property, get those valuations put into emails or letters get a mortgage redemption figure from your mortgage company. If there are going to be any early repayment penalties, make sure that we've got documentation to confirm what those are and how, you know, and, and the terms of that. So when does that end? Um, moving on to bank statements, it's making sure that you've got 12 months worth of bank statements for each account that you're named on. So that's not just accounts in your sole name, but also joint accounts that you're named on. Um, and it also includes accounts that perhaps, you know, you might think, oh, there's only a penny in that, or there's only five pounds, you know, it's not an account that I really use very often. But if they kind of know that you might have that account, you're just raising further questions down the line. So it's just important that you disclose all accounts and, and give, as Matt said earlier, give almost over disclose um, so that there's no question that you haven't provided everything that needs to be provided. And what if you don't have the documentation? I mean, it's quite common. And, and generally, this is, you know, speaking in general, generalities, but quite often you'll get wives whose husbands have controlled the finances for years and years, and they don't have stuff. There's, let's say, that might be joint accounts, joint investments. I don't have that documentation. I don't really know. I didn't deal with that. You know, how do you deal with that? If, you know, is that something to panic over? 
No, it's not something to panic over. I think it's just something to be honest about. And, you know, it may be, for example, that you know that you've got Santander bank accounts, but you don't know what the details are. You've never seen copies of the statements. But that's not going to stop you going into Santander, providing your ID and getting access to that account. So, you you know, you could potentially still get the still get an idea um, by doing that for yourself. Um, equally, though, if there are, you know, if your partner has been the one that's been controlling the accounts and you have no idea where some of these savings and investment accounts are, mm. Then at that stage, I think, you know, it's just a case of being honest about that within your form E. And obviously what we then need to do is wait for the husband's or wife's form E to come through, which will hopefully provide all of that information and fill plug the gaps. And what if it doesn't? What if the what and you know, this happens, you get a form E from the other side and it is rubbish, uh, and there's stuff missing and it's silent or it's late or it doesn't happen. You know, that that's a that's a really common question. And often in cases like this, there's a lot of mistrust, isn't there? You know, your client will say to you, well, he slash she isn't going to do this or is going to be rubbish when it comes in. How, you know, how do you how do you get around that problem? So we can raise what we call questionnaires after we've exchanged the formies. So if when we go through the formie, it looks like there's obvious information missing. And it may be simply that, you know, the client has said they definitely had an account with NatWest and there's no reference in the form E to an account with NatWest. Then we can ask that question, you know, did you have an account with NatWest? Please, can you provide statements? It may be that there are questions being raised from the documents themselves. So it may be that there's transfers going out of the account that look like they're going to another account that haven't been disclosed and we can raise questions on that. So, I mean, the questionnaire is not where we are cross-examining the other party. This isn't, a, this isn't a case of sort of having a mini final hearing via correspondence, but it's about plugging those gaps um, and asking them the information that appears to be missing from their for me. Yeah, it, I, I see a lot where someone's using a questionnaire to kind of say, well, your position there is ridiculous. How can you need this much for your rent going forwards? Or how much, you know, how can you justify spending this much on clothes on a month to month basis? And, and that's something that comes up often and it's understandable that clients feel that way but it's not the right time to do it it's about clarifying what's in there or looking for missing information um i suppose just going back and actually on that point i think it, one of the tricky parts at the back end of the the for me is about your budget going forwards i think it's something that is is kind of tricky to do so what you need to do is provide an estimate of what your ongoing expenses are likely to be and and the reason for this is the court wants to know, can these parties meet their own income needs going forwards? If someone's saying they need four grand a month to live, for example, you know, can they afford that? You know, can they do it on their own income? Or if they, you know, can increase their own capacity, can they meet that? Or is there a case where they might need maintenance if the other party has a bit more income? And let's say their income is, you know, six grand a month and their needs are four grand a month. They theoretically got some surplus income to meet uh, the other party's income needs. Now, I'm sure this probably happens to you as well. What most often happens is both parties will say my income is X and my income needs are Y and Y exceeds X most of the time. And that's that's a very common thing. And, you know, it's a difficult situation because normally your expenses are at the level of a two person household and trying to adjust a one person household involves a drop in income. But it's kind of it takes a while for the, the actual expenditure to catch up with that. Um, but I think filling out the budget is a really tricky thing to do. I mean, how do you work with clients to do that when someone says, well, I don't have a clue what my council tax is going to be because I don't know where I'm going to be living. You know, it's quite a tricky process, isn't it? I mean, I think budgets are difficult for everybody. I mean, anybody that's tried to sort out their own just monthly monthly budget, whether it be to save for a holiday or a new car or whatever it is, it's always tricky to really estimate oh, yeah, exactly mass. what it is. Absolute shambles. <laughs> what it is that you're going to be spending. And I mean, we were just talking about clients that perhaps haven't been involved in the finances. Yeah. So they don't know how much the mortgage payments are. They don't know how much they spend on gas and electricity. They have no idea what a lot of these costs are you know I've had quite a few clients in in that exact position recently and therefore trying to f fill out a budget is is almost impossible because they just they have no idea of what their current spending is to be able to then predict what they think their future spending is I mean I suppose it's important to say that there is likely to be a degree of having to cut your cloth on both sides you know we are splitting one set of finances and one house um, and we're going to be move for moving forward with two separate properties and what that means is that the expenses are going to increase 
but perhaps the income coming in is not going to increase significantly. It may well be that your expenses can't be moving forward exactly what they have been during the during the marriage. And it's important that both parties are quite realistic with that. Um, but as you said, I think it's quite it's quite normal that when we get these schedule of outgoing as they do exceed income, it's a case of sitting down with the client and seeing whether or not we can rejig some of those figures and, and have a think about them from a really realistic point of view. If the schedule of outgoings is completely unrealistic, um, it may also be that I suggest that they speak to a financial advisor or a financial planner who can really sit down with them, particularly, if, again, if it's a client that hasn't been involved in the finances, they can sit down with somebody who is independent um, and really get to the bottom of what they think their income needs are. Yeah, there's actually a company called Pennywise that um, prepare budgets for divorce proceedings. And what they can do if someone really can't face doing a budget is um, they will go through bank statements and say, look, we've looked at what your actual expenses are. And we think that it's this. And we know from our big bank of information that cost of repairing, you know, white goods over X years for, you know, your sort of general living circumstances is, is this amount. And, and they will do it. Um, so, you know, people do have that option because sometimes and I think also because it comes at the end of the form people slightly leave that bit till the end and then get onto it and go oh my god I've just done all my bank statements and that was exhausting and I've been chasing my pension company oh top tip request your pension information the second you need it because they take forever so yeah it can be really really tricky I guess in in terms of I mean what we haven't really kind of talked about is what the purpose of doing the forming is we say that's the first step and we say that you know we need full and frank disclosure what what's yeah what is full and frank disclosure and why is that important and for a client saying well look i know what ish what my spouse has got why do we need to go through this isn't this a complete waste of time you know why do we do it because they may not know <laughs> what their spouse's finances are and it's important that we have a what what we basically do is we take the two formies and we prepare a schedule of assets so we consolidate that information and we then have a very detailed blueprint of the finances of the marriage if you like and what we're able to take from that then is to start to to negotiate how we're going to split those assets between the parties and it's important that we have that full and frank financial disclosure because if well the 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 end result the aim of the game if you like is to get a financial order so to have a financial order approved by the judge that's binding on on both parties now once you've got that financial order it's almost impossible to reopen it. It's almost impossible to renegotiate it. And the problem will be is if you get your financial order based on what you thought your ex-partner had, and it then transpires a few months later that they had been, I don't know, investing without you knowing about it, or they had a property that they'd never spoken to you about, um, and suddenly you find out it will be very, very difficult to reopen that order because the argument will be that you should have asked for that information during the course of those negotiations. So it's about making sure that we have all of the information that we need so that we can negotiate a fair settlement um, and have that order approved knowing that everything's included. Yeah, I mean, I think it is very difficult to reopen settlements, but you know, on the flip side, because we don't want to be suggesting to people, well, if you don't put it on the form, then yeah. no one's ever no, no one's ever going to know. Firstly, you sign a statement of truth, and if you lie on this form, a technically it can be punished as a contempt of court. Um, if you don't give full and frank disclosure, if you don't seek it, then subject to certain circumstances, you might end up carrying the can for that. But if you are deliberately withholding information, or providing misleading information, or failing to update information, because the duty of full and frank disclosure is ongoing and continuous. It's not, well, I disclosed it out of the form A and whoops, I received the three million pounds inheritance the week after I didn't need to do it because I've already done my form A. You know, those are the very limited grounds for what we call a set aside. So you can set aside the financial order on the basis of kind of non-disclosure, fraudulent non-disclosure. Um, but they're really messy. And like you've just come through your divorce and your financial settlement and you want to be going back and undoing those. They're really tricky. Uh, they're quite risky sets of proceedings. So, you know, the, the the advice has to be to give full disclosure and seek full disclosure. Because in, if we move on to what's the long term impact, I guess, of a financial settlement, when you're looking at what you've done with the capital, with the house, with the companies, with the pensions, that's it, isn't it? You know, it's a, it's one bite of the cherry on, on those in the vast majority of cases. 
there is no scope to say, well, you know, I agree that it would be a 50-50 sale of the house, you know, and we split the proceeds equally, but the house actually sold for less than I thought. So can we change that? You know, you can't really do that except in very, very rare circumstances. Um, so that's why it's so crucially important. Now, the, the slight loophole, if you like, to that is if you, there is a spouse or maintenance order, that remains variable. So orders about providing extra income can change. They can go up, they can go down, they can sometimes be extended. Again, it's not particularly common, particularly for an increase in spousal maintenance. It's very, very, very difficult. But you've got to go into these things thinking, well, this is my my one chance to get a fair deal. And if we do a deal and I decide later that I don't like it, and that's really, really tricky. Um, so I think that's, you know, that's why we're, we're so big on it, why family lawyers will generally say you've got to have disclosure. And sometimes the disclosure does show exactly what you think it's going to show. You know, I can't pretend that that doesn't happen. And we say, well, you know, we just need to check. We just need to check everything's fine. The disclosure comes in and it's exactly what we expected. But that gives a level of security, a level of safety, and probably promotes a bit of trust um, in the negotiations and makes reaching a settlement a bit easier, I'd argue. Um, so what's your top tips, then, Lisa, for someone who's, you know, on the process of trying to get the financial settlement sorted? You know, let's say the divorce is, the divorce paperwork's all being done and sort of amicable and the parties are thinking, right, we need to sort out the finances. What's your sort of top tips at that stage for people, how they can embark on the process in the best possible way? I think it's just preparation is key. So start as early as you can gathering all of the documentation that you need, all of your bank statements, get the valuations, get your pension, the request into the pension companies to get your CEVs and really start to gather all of that information and really front load it so that when you come to an appointment with a solicitor or a mediator or however it is that you're you're going to be negotiating your finances, you've got all of that information ready to go. Yeah, definitely. I, th I think so. Um, my my number one bit of advice is um, don't leave you for me to last minute. I mean, that's a really obvious thing to say. If you're in court proceedings, just a word on timing, and it's different if it's out of court, but in court proceedings, you've got 10 weeks from the date that your application is issued by the court to prepare you for me. And normally if we're out of court, I'd say eight weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, six weeks, depending on the on the case. Don't leave everything to like week nine to start looking at it it's a lengthy process you're better doing it in trips and traps um if you're working with a lawyer on it you know it's ideal to get it to us a couple of weeks before exchange date so we can go through it and help you finesse things you know answer any queries stuff that might not be presented in the quite, quite the correct way highlight things that have been missed um and it takes a long time and i cannot stress the tediousness of it for clients um it's really boring um just doing it little and often and get your head around it is absolutely the way. So these are some really boring tips on a quite boring subject in terms of the for me. But yeah, preparation is key and doing it in drips and drabs really, I think, really makes a big difference to, to, to preparing a document that is the most important document you're going to prepare in sorting out your finances. I mean, it's that simple. And one of the biggest processes of your life, it's the most important document, I think. Um, and if that goes wrong, it can have kind of, really quite lasting consequences yeah so that's it for this episode of stow talks thanks for listening if you would like more information on our podcasts head over to stowtalks.co.uk and please rate like share and review this podcast where you can 